Luke chapter 2, 22 to 32. Let's read together. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. You may now take your seats. <coughs> Pardon the voice again. It's been almost a month now that I've been battling. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have fever, but that's okay. It, it is wonderful to be part of the church, a church that declares the gospel, a, a, a church that, that sings about the gospel, a church that retells the story of the gospel. I'm happy to be sharing with all of you God's word this Christmas Eve. Most of us have memories of Christmas that are very dear to us. And most of them are those when we were younger, right? Filipinos say Christmas is for kids, and we are all kids by heart. And we all have those wonderful, wonderful memories about our time when we were kids, during these times. The other day, I was just reminiscing while I was driving, and I was just like reminded of wonderful memories of being a kid being a Filipino kid during this time. Remember, uh, just like you, I went out caroling. Uh, uh, I went from house to house. We would go to a subdivision nearby. In, in fact, we would go to a faraway subdivision. We were actually chased by dogs before. You need to learn how to run fast. And you need to learn how to uh, use your slippers, right, when you're being chased by dogs. I went to my Ninong and Ninang as well. Uh, uh, Emphasis on the singular. I only have one pair of Ninong and Ninang. That's so sad. And, and one died already. So I, I had only one Ninang to go to. So my sister made more than I did during this season. As, as Elder Nilo shared two weeks ago, we also went to COD. Sa Cubao, right? And, and I, I remember my dad carrying me just for me to see the... the, the uh, um, Display, right? The, the mechanical display. I remember those days. But you know what? Most precious to my heart is the waiting for my dad to come home during Christmas Eve. You see, my dad worked as a janitor at the Children's Medical Center. Now, Dr. Fedel Mundo General Hospital. Uh, uh, I don't know why, but they, they usually have work during Christmas Eve, but my dad would always come home around 10 p.m. I remember vividly, very vividly, while I was waiting for, for my tatay to come home, uh, uh, I know he, he would bring home with him some goodies given by her, his doctor friends. And, and he would have ham, queso de bola, but my ultimate favorite is the tetra pack. You know the sun kiss in the triangular tetra pack? I, I wonder why they don't do that anymore, right? Do, do they still have those triangular tetra pack? They, those were a, like treats for me. So, so that's one thing that I had anticipated the most. That's one thing that I, I cherished the most during Christmas Eve, to, to, to wait for my dad, to wait for my tata. I remember I would be waiting as early as 8 p.m. When, when I know my tata will come home at 10, I, I would still be patiently waiting for him. I remember I would press my nose against the window panes and 
eagerly and patiently waiting for my tatay. I, if only I would press harder, maybe tatay would come home soon. And as soon as my, I hear my tatay's bike, kasi he goes to the hospital on his bike. As soon as I, I hear his bike, I remember jumping on him and hugging him tight. I will see my tatay later. I don't know if he could still carry me and, and uh, be embraced by me. I'm bigger than him right now. Those are fun memories of, of Christmas time. I greatly anticipated my tatay coming home during Christmas Eve. I, I share this with you because I think an operative word during Christmas is, is the word anticipation. Anticipation. I think the, the word that sticks to my heart, and I, I, I believe to, in our hearts as well, is the word anticipation. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one and only Savior. The, this w- was an event to the believers in God that they have waited for centuries, for millennia in fact, much longer than I waited for my tatay. From 8 to 10, the believers in God waited patiently for centuries, for a millennium just to wait on that wonderful, wonderful coming of the King. And why do I share that? We see this anticipation probably most clearly in one of the most unknown and unforgotten, or probably forgotten characters of Christmas. When we talk about Christmas, which character comes to mind? You see, of course, Jesus, Mary, well, Rudolph. Uh, Joseph, perhaps, right? There were no reindeers there, right? Maybe the wise men, right? Right? The shepherds, the angels. But have you seen a Christmas card with Simeon on it? No. Rarely would we hear or see a retelling or probably a video or a movie of a Christmas story with Simeon on it. He is a guy that we sometimes leave out when it comes to the Christmas story. But I think he embodies the wonder and the amazement and the excitement and the anticipation of this event. So, as we look at chapter 2 of Luke, we learn much, much more about this special man. Much, much more about this special man. Simeon is our lost man in the Christmas story. He is mentioned nowhere else in the Bible but here. He makes a brief cameo, right, in the biblical narrative regarding the Christmas story. Then he disappears, He would no longer be read or seen in other passages. But, friends, these few moments that we see him in Scripture are so precious. Because here we see about his faithfulness, about his devotion to God. Here we see a very faithful and devout man. Here we have a man who shows up at about six weeks after uh, Jesus' birth. This was a time that Jesus was brought to the temple, as we have read, to be presented there according to the law of Moses, according to Leviticus. In this section of Luke, this is the first time that this man sees Christ. This is the first time he would see Christ. We don't know a lot about this man. We don't know his background. We don't know if he's married or not. We actually don't know how old he is, but he's sometimes and he's often depicted as a, an older person. But we don't know. We're not sure about that. We don't even know if he was a priest. He was just, according to the narrative, a man prompted by the Holy Spirit. And then he shows up in the temple. We are not given any more details about him because those details are not that important, friends. I believe that what is in Scripture is to focus ourselves in his devotion, in his anticipation. Clearly, we see from Scripture what he is thinking about, what he felt. What is important for us to know is what he was anticipating. So this afternoon, we want to focus. Yes, we read a big chunk. This is a very familiar passage. But let's focus our attention on verse 25. 
In verse 25, there's a phrase there. Uh, let me read to you verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. <coughs> and the Holy Spirit was upon him. That is the phrase that we want to look into as we look at this bigger chunk. Waiting here in other versions say, looking. This has an idea of more than just a casual observation. It is actually an anxious waiting. It is an eager anticipation. And what was he waiting for? He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Literally, it means the comfort of Israel. This talks about the comfort and redemption of Israel. It's, phrase, it's a phrase that talks about the looking forward to the coming Messiah, to the one who would bring comfort to Israel. And that is a promised king who would come from the line of David. The word waiting here is in the present tense. What does that mean? It has an idea of constantly waiting, continuously looking, that was characterized by Simeon. He was waiting, constantly and continuously waiting. He was looking for the coming Messiah, friends. He was waiting for the return of the king. And when I say the return of the king, I'm not talking about Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. He was cons his consuming passion was to wait on the king of kings. That is what drove him to be in the temple each day. If this is a present tense uh, verb, then that means we see him every day in the temple. This is what drove him each day in the temple. This is what he would think often. Friends, this anticipation has been building for more than just this man's lifetime. It actually has been building for 10 lifetimes. We see him here. We see one person also. What's the big deal, pastor? He's just one man. He is, he's been looking forward to the Messiah. But friends, no. This anticipation has been building for, for more than 10 lifetimes. It was something that has been building since the beginning of time. For thousands of years, there was an anticipation of the coming one, a deliverer, a king, a savior. But let's ask, what brought about the need for this anticipation? What, why, are they, why are they anticipating for comfort and consolation? Why was there a need for the coming of a deliverer or a Messiah in the first place? What was the cause of anticipation? Remember after God's creation? Remember how He beautifully created everything? Then He created Adam and Eve, His masterpiece. Remember how they sinned against God? And I love how Elder Jojo preached on this yesterday. How, how they were saying, we don't need you, God. We, 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 we do not like you at all commanding us. They sinned against God. Following their fall, in Genesis 3, 17 and 19, it reads, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have it, eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground before you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. But the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see, friends, creation was cursed as a result of the fall. There will be hardships, there will be trials, there will be suffering, and there will be death. Death is very imminent. And inevitable because of Adam's sin. But thankfully, praise the Lord that God did not leave it there. He did not leave us without comfort. He did not leave us without hope. 
He did not leave us without having the opportunity of being saved from this pitiful state. Remember Genesis 3.15? The gospel in the Old Testament? We see that promise. This was actually spoken to Satan who moved in the serpent. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, the enemy of our souls will be not will be not without a contender. God says, I will bring someone who would crush the serpent's head. That contender will be born of a woman. And that is very important. So the anticipation now begins, right? There was a fall. This is the cause of the anticipation. And now we see the anticipation begins. Someone would bring forth comfort and rescue. Someone would rescue mankind from its from his pitiful state. And from that moment on, we see the continuous anticipation for the coming of the serpent's head crusher. One who would lift the curse and save mankind. For those of us who were attending our study on Genesis during Wednesdays, we saw how Eve expressed this anticipation right after she gave birth to Cain. What did she say when she gave birth to Cain? Genesis chapter 1, uh, uh, Genesis 3. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and born Cain, saying, I have gotten a man without the help of the Lord. Now you see in Hebrew, that phrase, with the help of, is not there. So it would literally read, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Eve was thinking, maybe this is the promise in Genesis 3.15. Maybe this is the man who would crush the head of the serpent. And we saw in our study, right? In Genesis that as, as Eve was anticipating that this might be the one who would be the Redeemer, proved to be wrong in the life of Cain. It proved to be the opposite in the life of Cain. A thousand years later, eight generations after Adam, comes Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah, the son of Methuselah. Listen to Lamech in Genesis chapter 5, 28 to 29, as he expressed this an- anticipation, this same anticipation for a savior. Verse 28, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah. What does Noah mean? Saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one, this this Noah, shall bring us relief or or rest from from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. You see, Lamech had hope that maybe this son, maybe this is the one. He may be the one who whom God would send to bring rest to our souls. That was not the case, right? Remember in the lifetime of Noah, humanity was wicked. So wicked was was mankind that God needed to wipe out everyone except for eight because of God's grace. Let's move ahead another thousand years to the time of Abraham. God promised Abraham that through him all families of the earth would be blessed. Abraham, because of God's grace, had a messianic hope. He was also anticipating the coming of the seed who will bless every family in the world. Remember when Jesus was uh, having a discourse with with the Jews in in John chapter 8. We read in verse 56. Your father Abraham, said Jesus, rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. I believe Jesus is telling us that Abraham had the same anticipation. He had that same messianic hope. Job, who lived about the same time as as Abraham lived, had the same hope, had the same anticipation. Listen to Job in Job 19, verse 25 to 27. For I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh 
I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Even Job, the man who probably suffered the most within his lifetime, he was greatly comforted amidst all his troubles because he has this anticipation. He has this hope that God would send someone who would bring him rest. About 500 years later, the anticipation continues. We see Moses coming into the scene. He was used by God to rescue Israel, but he was not the deliverer. He was not the deliverer. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, we read, The Lord your God, says Moses, will raise up for, for you a prophet like me from among you, meaning from within the Israelites, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses had that anticipation, friends. Not just Simeon. In fact, when we look at Hebrews 11, the, the honor roll of faith, we read in, according to uh, Hebrews about the faith of Moses, verse 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the, sons, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater, greater wealth than, he, than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. Moses, he chose to be identified with the people of God from whom Messiah will come from rather than the riches of Egypt. The anticipation for the Messiah continues on, friends, as you move forward in Scripture. Remember Hannah? Remember Hannah? He was, she was praying for a son, and then uh, after praying hard, she, she, she was answered by God. Remember his, her praises? Listen to her praises. And this is staggering, friends, uh, as, as we read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. Listen to what she says at the end of her song. 1 Samuel 2, verse 10. Again, you need to understand, God has given her a son. And listen to her song. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. There had been no king yet during this time. Yet he says, she says, there will be a king. And exalt the horn of his anointed. Anointed here is the word Mashiach. You see, Hannah, as he was, she was given a son, she also had hope for a coming redeemer king who would give them hope, who would rule and judge the earth. Less than a hundred years after, here comes King David. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, we see the promise given to King David. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. David was given specific details that through him will come forth one who would reign forever. One who would be king forever. If you look at the book of Psalms, David, among many others, spoke of the same king with much, much anticipation. The prophets have unloaded to us these, uh, th this wonderful anticipation for this coming king. From Hosea to Joel to Amos to Micah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah. All these men prophesied with much great anticipation for this coming Redeemer that would bring us comfort and consolation and rest. The most famous, perhaps, is the prophet Isaiah, who wrote about this anticipated Redeemer over 18 passages that specifically refers to the coming Messiah. And what was, what's the most famous? Isaiah 9, 6-7, read a while ago. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Even the last book of the Old Testament shows this great anticipation. 
Malachi 4 verse 5 speaks of a forerunner for this anticipated king. Listen to Malachi 4 verse 5 to 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. You see, friends, this anticipation goes back all the way to Genesis. And it covers from Genesis all the way to Malachi. Then there was great silence. For 400 years, there was no revelation from God through the prophets. But that did not stop the people of God to be hoping, to be wishing, to be waiting on this promised Messiah. And their longing became much stronger. We saw the cause of anticipation, right? The fall of mankind. And we went through these Old Testament characters, not just for you to have a a theological uh, backing that the Messiah is is indeed taught in the Old Testament. No, not not just that. We, We look into it to show you that it's not just Simeon who was anticipating the coming of the king. It goes way back to Genesis to show you that Jesus is the most anticipated man all throughout human history. All the universe revolves around this man, the one that we celebrate today. The coming of Jesus was not just a minor glitch or a minor event, friends. It was not a fulfillment of just a few obscure prophecies. He was not just a fad that was a hot item for a time. These examples of Eve, Abraham, Moses, Job, and Isaiah shows us that the anticipation from the beginning of time is the same anticipation we see from this unknown and forgotten man of Christmas, Simeon. And in the passage before us, we see Simeon carrying out that anticipation too. We don't know how long he has been waiting for the Christ, for the Messiah. How long did God reveal to him that he will not die until he sees the Messiah? Had it been just hours? Perhaps days? No, perhaps weeks or months? Maybe years? Maybe decades? We do not know. We do not know. The Bible does not mention that. All we know is that he has been continuously and constantly waiting for the Messiah. Going to the temple day after day, day after day. Imagine his day. Imagine every day he would go to the temple. He would see, that that's a, a young couple. They have a, a child w- with them. Maybe he's the one. Maybe he's the one. I- imagine the, his, his excitement. Imagine how he continuously wait, waited, hoping that maybe this day would be the day he would lay eyes on the one. In a sense, friends, just like I was pressing my nose against the window panes as I was waiting for my tatai, Simeon was pressing his nose against the window panes, waiting for this Messiah to come. How long, oh God, how long? He's not the one. The other day, not, he's not the one. I, I was hoping he was the one. And then it happened. Then that day arrived. And just like I was so excited when my tate came home with that sunk, sunk his triangular tetra pack, when, when I gave my tate a great, great embrace, imagine how excited Simeon was. Can you see his smile? Can you see his tears? But when you're so excited and you're anticipating someone, you shed tears of joy. This is the one. But everyone all throughout history has been waiting for. It's him. It's him. He's here. I mean, can you imagine his excitement? He might have rushed to Mary and Joseph. He perhaps hugged the baby so tight. He was thrilled. He was amazed. He was in awe. In fact, Simeon was so overtaken with joy that he said, I can die now. 
I can, I can die now, Lord. Lord, take me home. I'm ready. I, that's all I need to see, to have a glimpse of this Savior. He was satisfied. He was comforted. His anticipation was realized in seeing the one whom Eve, Abraham, Moses, and the rest of the prophets have longed for. Nothing else matters. Everything else seems to fade away. Compared to beholding the beauty of the promised one. Thousands of years of agonizing waiting, friends. In the fullness of time. The Savior has come. The Redeemer is here. Everything else means nothing. The infant who is the infinite one is more than enough. More than enough for Simeon. What can we learn from this section of Scripture? As we zoomed in to his anticipation, we zoomed in to his great eagerly, uh, great eagerness to be, to, to be able to witness the coming king. What can we learn from the roster of people? We mentioned, not to mention the others who waited patiently for the coming Savior. Just what can we learn from this devoted man of faith, Simeon? It's true we weren't there. So therefore, in as much as we want to say, oh, I can, I can relate. No, it's impossible for us to relate. 2,000 years divorce from when it happened, we may not truly identify with the emotions and convictions in the story. We cannot fully understand what the shepherds went through, what Mary felt, what Joseph felt, what the wise men felt, or what Simeon felt. It's hard to really imagine the joy, the anticipation that they felt. Simeon is a great example for us. Because aren't we also waiting for the coming back of the king? Aren't we anticipating an exciting and joyous occasion as well? Aren't we too waiting for the Messiah to come back? Aren't we? Aren't we? We are, right? We are. We too are eagerly waiting for the coming of this king. We too are waiting for his return to set his kingdom up forever. To make things right. To stop all the nonsense in the world. Aren't you tired of all the nonsense of the world? Aren't you tired of getting tired while working and laboring for the Lord? Aren't you tired of not being able to worship him in the utmost? To love him perfectly? We are waiting for him, all right, to reign in righteousness. Simeon has much to teach you and me, friends. He displayed much faith in God. His life was oriented around waiting for the coming of the Messiah. What patience, right? To wait and watch each day? What patience? What hope? What hope in the Lord? What trust that God would indeed fulfill His promises? Uh, I don't know. If, if, wouldn't you be discouraged? I think I would. It's been like two weeks now and He's not here yet. A, a decade, a year. What hope? Simeon's life was oriented around the Savior's coming. As we celebrate his first coming, may I ask you, is yours oriented around his return? Or are we settling for the first coming? I came across a song by a Christian group called New Song. And the song is entitled Fingertips and Noses. It's a cute tune. And describes the case of special needs kids, wherein they had their teacher, they were taught one day of the coming of Jesus Christ, how he came from heaven to earth to give himself as a ransom for those who would believe in him, how he did it on the cross of Calvary. And as the teacher explained this to the special needs kids that, that Jesus died for them, they embraced this truth. They, they embraced this truth. And they eagerly awaited his return. In fact, the song talks about how these kids we're eagerly waiting for, for the king to come, that they can't stay put on their chairs. They would usually, they would uh, occasionally go out to the windows and wait, 
for the coming of Jesus Christ, they would always go to the window and see and check if Jesus was coming. Let me read to you this song. Up in the hills somewhere in Kentucky is a little old school way back in the nothing where special kids born with special needs are sent to learn life's ABCs. Their teacher, Mrs. Jones, tells them all about Jesus, how in the twinkling of an eye, he's coming back to get us. About streets of gold and pearly gates, how they want to go. They just can't wait, and she can't keep them in their seats. They are all at the window straining to see. Well, she tried to explain to the kids about his coming. Ooh, she tried to calm them down, but they just wouldn't listen. They just giggled and they clapped their hands. They're so excited that he's coming for them. And the first thing you know, they're out of their seats again. Back at the window, straining to see. Where will Jesus find us? Where he comes again? When he comes again? Will we be like children? fingertips and noses for him to come again. All we know is that we love him so. And if he said he'd come, he's coming. And we can't keep our windows clean for our fingertips and noses. Friends, yes, we are celebrating the first coming of Jesus Christ. But are your noses pressed against the windows as you eagerly await his return? If you're a child of God, He would return from you. He would come back for you, I mean. I wish we have the same innocent fervency as the special kids mentioned in this song. I hope we have the same uh, uh, faith that we saw in Simeon. My prayer, I wish I had the same innocent longing that I had before when I was waiting for my tatay to come home. I hope this year, friends, Christmas will be a time of reflection for all of us to fully take time in that anticipation felt by Simeon and all those who were before him. Let this be a time to remind all of us, not just of the first coming, but the second coming, that Jesus will come back. He will. He will. We await the coming back of our beautiful Savior and King. We went through jet tour of the Old Testament, right? And we looked at how the Old Testament from beginning to end showed us that great anticipation for the King. You know what? The New Testament ends that way. It ends with the same anticipation. In the last book, Jesus speaking to the Apostle John, he said to John the Beloved, I am coming quickly. To which the apostle replied, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Are your nose pressed against the windows? Are you eagerly waiting for the king? Would you say with much, much conviction, I'm okay to die now. Take me home, Lord. Would you say with great, great conviction, Come now, Lord, come. You can't expect a, a meaningful Christmas if you're just celebrating the first Advent. Believers celebrate the first Advent, but are excited for His return. Friends, He will come back. He will come back. And I pray that we would be like Simeon, that our lives are oriented in this great anticipation. I hope we would be like these special kids who can't wait, who can't stay put, but patiently waiting, go, going back the windows and checking, is Jesus here? Is Jesus here? What if he comes back tonight? Oh man, that would be wonderful. That would be the best Christmas ever, right? But while we're waiting for him, I pray that our lives are revolving around this great hope. Shall we pray? Lord, we praise you for the faith of Simeon, how 
he patiently waited for you. We thank you for wonderful truth that you have revealed in Scripture. We thank you for the great anticipation that goes way, way back to Eve, to Lamech, to Abraham, and the rest of the prophets. We thank you, O oh God, that we who are in your family by grace have this great anticipation in our hearts. Allow us by your grace, Lord, not to be drowned by the commercialism of the season. May we be like Simeon. May I be like my younger version, my younger uh, um, version when I was patiently waiting, excited for my tatay to come home. May we be like these special kids who have that great, great anticipation for the coming back of the King. We love you, Lord. We love you indeed. And we praise you for coming. And we praise you, for we know that you will come back. We love you. We praise you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas.